All right, hello and welcome. My name is Diana Kelly, and I'm joined today by Peter Dillerby and Michelle Gerlay, and we're gonna be talking about automated threat detection. To get us started, could you just give us a little bit of background on who you are, what you do, and your views on automatic, uh, automated, automatic, automated threat detection. Michelle, let's start with you, please. Sure, absolutely, thank you, Diane. So again, my name is Michelle Gerlay, I'm the CEO of Towerwall. Um, Towerwall is an information security boutique and it's all we walk, talk, live and breathe is information security. So this topic is near and dear to my heart, um, both from an automated perspective, but also from a manual perspective. Um, can't wait to get started. Excellent. Peter. Yes, good morning. My name is Peter Doherty, CEO of MantisNet, and MantisNet develops real-time network uh, sensing capabilities, uh, specifically software solutions for cybersecurity fraud dis detection and lawful intercept operations and applications. So we're all about automated threat detection and response. So looking forward to the discussion today. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks, everybody who's on the line. Uh, you can answer questions or ask questions. We can answer questions. You can answer them, too. Uh, but you can please ask questions. You can just uh, type it into the, the box, and we will get to them as soon as, as possible. We really please, you know, it's, it's more fun when it's interactive. So please let us know what you want to know. All right. Uh, but to get us started, there's a, an ESG stat that 76% of cyber professionals say that performing threat detection and response is actually harder now than it was two years ago. And as we were prepping to get into this conversation, we even went back a little bit farther in that, you know, so not just two years, but, you know, five years, 10 years. I, I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on what's changed? How has is, how is the, the space evolved? And what's really been a big pivot point in the last couple of years? And, and Peter, I was wondering if you could start us off on that. Sure. Well, first of all, we believe this is definitely true from our recent experience as well as experiences over the you know 10 plus years. Um, in many cases now, the bad actors are collaborating and getting increasingly sophisticated with shared cloud-based tools, in some cases a a using AI and ML technologies to affect you know, fraud and, and, and breaches. So it's, it's really a matter of, uh, you know, what got us here today isn't going to work in the future. We've really got to take a look at, at better utilizing the combination of people, processes, and technologies. So not just focusing on the technologies, whether it's AI or ML, but looking more holistically within organizations at the processes and the people. Uh, you know, specifically, we're seeing increasingly operations, fraud detection, and security teams are more often now talking to each other. Five years ago, those teams were firewalled intentionally. And so you had these silos of information and that allowed some of these bad actors to evolve in their capability. So we agree that uh, it's the world has changed, but there's also a lot of uh, promising uh, advancements there that uh, we think can, can really help address these issues in the future. So um, um, one of the things you said that the, the statistic is it's gotten harder in the last two years, and you talked about how there's actually increased collaboration in a lot of organizations now because there's a realization that you know, a threat to the cyber cyberspace or the information technology side mm -hmm. of the business. But do you think that that collaboration is is making things harder, or do you think it's just that the the scope of the the attack surface is so great that that's why things have gotten harder? I think it, it well, our, our experience is it, it has the pot potential to make it easier, right? Yeah. Um, uh, many times these organizations are purposefully siloed from each other for governance reasons, et cetera. Uh, but the fact is when you take a look at the spectrum between fraud detection and cybersecurity, you know, it's a continuum, right? The the bad guys don't obey the silos, right? Of you know these governance silos between these different groups, and they're sharing the tools. So we're seeing some of the more better informed uh, organizations are allowing some of the the cross pollination, in some cases, more collaboration uh, going forward. Okay, got it. Now, Michelle, are, are you is this are you seeing this too? Do you think it's gotten harder in the past couple of years, or? I think it's gotten harder, but I'm just going to add. So when you talk about fraud detection and information security, one of our verticals is um, retail. 
And so what we're seeing, exactly what you said, is that they were really, really siloed. And we're working with some um, women clothing organizations right now where everything's falling under the CIO. And, and that fraud detection is, is really now part of the technology, but it's also people process and information security and compliance and risk is part of that as well, which changes the whole dynamics of how you can combat quote unquote fraud. And that's data fraud as well as fraud inside the stores. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting time yeah. um, in, with collaboration. Yeah, it, and you know, one of the things that's, that's adding to the problem is the, the growth of the volume of just mm-hmm. of a couple of things, right? The, the threat feeds. Um, let's, let's start there with the threat feeds because I think this is a, a big you know, concern. A lot of companies will say, how many threat feeds do I need? You know, can, I bring the, can I automate and normalize all the threat feeds together? I mean, what, are, what have you seen and what's, what's working in terms of trying to get what's is there a set number of you know i should get three threat feeds from, from uh, two from paid service one maybe from OSINT or you know thoughts on how to deal with just the number of threat feeds and how to bring them in usefully i mean i'd say it's more about quality rather than quantity right yeah. um people have to you know the biggest problem is there's too many you know in some cases too many false positives uh, so the analysts uh, are faced with information overload so it's as much quality and this is Probably one area where automation and some of the advanced, more advanced software technologies can help, right? Reducing these false positives, helping increase the reliability of the alarms and and alerts. So I'm not sure it's a function of number of feeds from my perspective, but more a function of quality. I don't, yeah. I I agree. I agree with the quality, um, but I would disagree on the number of false positives that have been going down because of quote unquote um the technology the ai the ml the just the newest new technology and i know we were talking about you know using the word next generation and it's like oh i don't want to do it but it's like okay what is that next piece and there's so many cool technologies that are coming out and it's making us think completely differently you know intrusion Mm -hmm action prevention, you know, um, vulnerability management. It's like just this really amazing time that we're in from mm-hmm. an information yeah. perspective. And and we need to really kind of break out of where we've been um, in the past, you know, five or 10 years. But, but with that, I think our customers are still getting so overloaded yes. with quote unquote so much data um, mm-hmm. and such bad data. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. that things just get completely just it, it just it, you go you go tone dead you go data dead yeah. right? mm-hmm. and so we need to really think about that and what we see as well Diane is that you, our customers have all these data feeds um, but they're not using the technology properly so mm-hmm. it's not tweaked it's not it's not giving them good information and so garbage in garbage out and so yeah. that to me is really important. Um, to help with that whole vulnerability management component. What do you see that works? I mean, how, what's a good way to make sure that you're not getting the garbage in? You talked about bad data. You know, what would, what does bad data, are these false positives? Is this data you don't want to collect as part of your threat detection? Um, you know, so we look at it. Melody signals that don't help. Yeah, so we look at it, actually, we, we step back, okay, and we look at it from a program perspective right it's as you said people process technology but it's really about programs it's about repeatable processes it's about documenting what's important to the organization um, from a tech from a, a data perspective right um, what what needs to have those those um, barriers put around them what's the what's the most important because you can't protect everything so again to me it's What's the technology? How's the technology going to get implemented? Who's going to run the technology? What kind of reports are going to be put in place? What's the remediation efforts? And how often does it happen? Because we can put all this stuff in place um, and we talk about, we're talking about threat management and automated threat management. We can put it all in place, but if it's not 
this is my word, pragmatized, mm-hmm. uh, it, nothing's going to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And you know, it's, it's, yeah, again, it's as much about the quality and the timeliness of the information. Cause many times, I mean, people will be using stale or age data. You take a look at some of these threat vectors here where they need to understand, you know, when was this domain spun up? Was it spun up a second or two seconds ago? And it's obviously, you know, um, a potential risk to the organization, but they may be accessing a database where they don't have the most current information. So they're not really working in real time like they should. And I think that's one of the biggest potential shifts right now is we do have the shift to more real time detection and remediation capabilities now by getting better real time data, better access to some of this third party data in real time via connectors and APIs. And then the advanced analytics infrastructure, which can now process it in some cases with streaming analytics in real time. So you get the sensing, the sense making, and the acting component there that can operate now at speed and scale. Whereas before, you weren't always sure, you know, what the age of some of these third-party data sources were, and you know, when was it last refreshed? And then you had to run now a, another process to do the analytics on it. Where now you can do this uh, streaming in real time. So that's back. That's why I think is one of the really exciting uh, aspects of the time and times in which we work now. Yeah, it's interesting that, that talking about the stale data, I had a, a great quote, a CISO was telling to me that, that one of his, his, I won't say which ISAC, but one of the ISAC feeds, he said, it's like day old donuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Can I use that in my blog? <laughs> I, it was a great quote, right? I love to <laughs> tell him I said that, so anonymized, but yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, but it's true. I mean, if, it, if it's a day old donut, right, it's stale and it's not necessarily going to give you the and the insight you need. We're talking about automated threat detection. Um, you know, I was, and there's, there's that, that, that bridge into detection and response. Mm-hmm. It's like if, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, nobody <laughs> hears it. You know, detecting is one thing, but it's really the response or what the action mm-hmm. will take after the threat has been detected. Um, thoughts? Anybody want to take a, a, a guess on how automated is automated and what, what <laughs> is there, as, as companies are looking at, what yeah. they'll want to automate, you know, any like guidelines on, it, yeah, this is something to, to automate. And okay, Michelle, you're ready. To yeah, Michelle, raising her hands. So I, I think like what, when I said just a little while ago, what we were talking about before this, the, that we started is that there are so many amazing tools and so many things that are happening right now to help our customers um, really understand what's happening inside their network, right? So there are, tools now where you know we use scanning technology um, and you really need to understand uh, what those levels um, and what those vulnerabilities are and so that you know my guys know that a step one and a step two putting together could be a critical vulnerability for that particular organization right so but but if you're having somebody scan using whatever technology it is they don't understand that. So the CIO is caring about the critical and high, and maybe that's not really important to the organization. So now there's tools out there to actually, you know, provide that information, actionable information, um, remediation information to the CIO, to his people, to, you know, to say, okay, this medium vulnerability is going to take care of these three critical vulnerabilities. We still need to take care of it, but... You know, mm-hmm. so there's tools out there and, and automated tools that still need human interaction, but really give better actionable information than just a quote unquote scanning tool. Yeah. And I, I really think so there's the detection component on one hand yeah. and then the response. Right. Yeah. Detection. Uh, you can never get good enough. Right. As far as improving the accuracy and speed mm-hmm. of detection. The response side, I hate to say it, is a little bit more complex because different businesses, different organizations have varying levels of risk tolerance. And we were talking about this before. You know, you may a large financial institution may be able to tolerate a little bit more risk uh, as opposed to shutting down transactions, which have, you know, a probability of, you know, 
exhibiting a false positive. So whereas other organizations have less, uh, have an increased risk tolerance and can afford to, you know, terminate an exchange or shut down or blacklist or do what, what's ever, whatever they need to do to remediate that threat. So it, the short answer is it depends from the way we see it, but reducing the time to detect and at least giving the customers the opportunity to reduce the time to react at least they have the tools now. They have the best available information mm. and the ability to respond if they want to. So I think that that detection response loop, tightening that, and I think collectively we in the industry are all focused on that. That's really key to giving, whether you're using AI and ML or you have an analyst and a team of analysts who are looking at threats to try to characterize them. And there's a lot, there's a lot more organizations now um, that have that quote unquote threat response mm-hmm. component. That they're either your the, our customers are either paying for or they're getting for free, uh, which I think is a really really amazing um, opportunity for customers to you know if there is an incident or something going on that they have that team of experts that they can call in uh, or you know on the endpoint you know perspective you know you have you know Microsoft endpoint you have the Sophos you have the CrowdStrike you have the different technologies that have that. Um, you know, the, the MRT, the MTR, M, M, yeah. BX, you know, everybody's calling it something different. Um, but, you know, that managed endpoint piece uh, that really I think is beneficial as well. So there's a lot of that managed piece, yeah. um, but the organizations still need to have some kind of overlay um, to manage the managed uh, um, person. Yeah. <laughs> You bring up endpoints, which is a good, you know, it's it's a good to, to think about architecturally. Where do you want to get the signal from to indicate if there is a threat to detect or not? So from our endpoints, right? But which system do we want to get it from? All the apps on the endpoints? Do we want right? You know, so just wondering, we want to get maybe from what's going on in the network, bring that information into the SOC, things like you know, right. DNS queries, activities on servers. What when somebody when organizations are starting to think about how they they optimize their automated threat detection what kind of signal do they need and are we talking about putting this into a sim within their SOC, or are we mm-hmm. talking about a different kind of a solution so i'll kick this off i think it's 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 all about situational awareness right you can't say endpoints are the end all right you can't say just by having a sophisticated thin solution that's going to solve all my woes. You know, it, it's about full situational awareness, and that's including the endpoint, but it's also, you know, looking at the network, the physical or virtual network, as well as taking a look at the, you know, server or cloud infrastructure and understanding what's going on in there. So you need to instrument all those areas. I we our company used to have this kind of a little bit of an orthodoxy about well the networks the computer that's all you need you know to get full situational awareness well that's not really the case when you really take two steps back and think about it you need to understand if the endpoint's been compromised or in the process of being compromised yep the network is a great place to look because everything traverses the physical or virtual network and we can instrument that up but you still need to have the awareness and the compute and storage and server infrastructure there to understand what's going on there and only by correlating and this is the big one of the bigger challenges correlating all this information uh, is key then if you can get all this really precise information in real time and then start looking at again analytics and advanced correlation then you can really get a good idea okay something's going on here that you know, goes over the baseline or normally expected behavior. Let's take a closer look and let's drill down into it. So, again, I you know, it would be nice to pick for to pick a fight here, but I really think it's about full situational awareness there. Okay. Well, and you didn't add IoT, right? Or the printer? Well, that's, that's anything, anything, whole, you know, anything that, yeah, that yeah. you can't put that can't be managed, right? That, uh, yeah. Uh, and that's a real. That's that yeah. not be managed, and that's yeah. terrifying. That's a huge threat vector. We've been working with a customer who, you know, uh, you know, the the endpoint in this case, the rogue camera, doesn't get detected by any scanning tools, by any other tool. Yet, when it initiates an outbound data transfer, 
You know, there are very few places you can look to, to figure out, uh, you know, that that device is misbehaving or it's been compromised and has been misbehaving. Yeah, it gets really scary in that world for these unmanaged devices. Yeah, that's a that's a whole nother discussion. It is. Yeah. It, it yeah. definitely is. But it, I mean, it's meaningful in this because it's true. You know, the the, the quality of the signal and, and the way the signal comes from gives us that, uh, you know, it gives us more insight into whether it's a threat or not. Um, and can, could it have, you know, impact on our business? Uh, some of the stuff that you were talking about reminds me of, of uh, a concept that my co some of my colleagues and I have been working on, which is we've looked at, at Dave McCrory's view of data gravity. I'm not sure if you've ever looked at that. I've heard of it, yeah. At VMware. Yeah, and, and, his, yeah. and he posited this idea that the data, the bigger it gets, the more gravitational pull it has, and it's going to pull uh, – uh, applications and workloads towards it, and it'll pull faster based on if there's a, a, an inability to tolerate latency, mm -hmm. or um, there's an issue with bandwidth. So if you have right. if you're for bandwidth, right, you can't have a, a slow time. You're going to pull. So now thinking, and well, we're, we said that that's really interesting, but think about that in security. Oh yeah. Yes. And suddenly you get from where we first saw, remember way, way back 20 plus years ago when we were first thinking of Sims as sort of moms, the managers of yep, managers, yep, and, managers and, yep. and then we made them, they were the, the de facto, this is going to be our forensic tool. We, we got to get right. every log from every place in the, the entire organization and there's got to be chain of custody and all of it because this could be in a court of law. And now we've kind of moved into, we're, we're seeing our SOC as this is the alert, this is where we go to, to hunt. It's giving us our yeah. early warning system. So as if we evolve it to think of it as an early warning system, is there a space to to appreciate data gravity by doing signal mm -hmm. analytics? Because as right. you mentioned, it's a hybrid cloud world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, many companies have their data in multiple clouds, and sometimes they don't even know which cloud it's in if it's a SaaS yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah. It's well. First is of all, there's automated. Is that a possibility for the future? Well, it, yeah. It's indicative of what we're all trying to solve, right? And, you yeah. know, first of all, there's this pesky little problem, you know, the speed of light, you know, you can consolidate data into a location, but if you have to access consolidated data from increasingly disparate geographic locations, it gets to be a problem. And then you get the second trend, which is the more distributed, you know, the whole mobile computing, distributed compu uh, computing and the IoT devices now to where now the, the sources of data is, you know, are even cast further and farther afield. You know, one approach to address this has been to move some of these analytics functions to the edge of the network, right? Yeah. It kind of runs counter to that, but the reality is how do you grasp with, you know, a vast concentration of data, as you said, with, you know, with a central data source and process that much data versus trying to move it to distributed detection, distributed processing and, and analytics at the edge of the network, that it may be more of a federated approach where you have the, the lightweight analytics detection and response capability on the edge of the network. Uh, and that they're doing a certain amount of autonomous process, but it's being coordinated, as I said, in kind of a federated approach with, with mm -hmm. a central entity or central intelligence, or in some cases, an organization that has responsibility for security and, uh, and threat detection. Okay, anything, any thoughts, Michelle? No, okay. Um, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a, a few years ago, everybody was talking about the best way to do threat sharing and, and threat detection was you know, with st sticks and taxi. Yes. And yeah. I have heard a lot less about sticks and taxi in the past couple of years. Has it fallen out of favor or just become so well adopted that people have just, we don't discuss it as much as we used to? In some cases, it's de facto, right? In terms yeah. of the information sharing, I, I think it's I think it's just kind of it hasn't gotten the press, right? Okay. So, yeah, I would agree with yeah. that. But it's just been adopted. Yeah, so we just feel really comfortable with it now. So um, back to the the automation and and sort of the the promise of of continued automation. Do you think that we're going to get to a point where the solutions where we can just 
trust them implicitly to shut things down. Yeah, I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, a lot of, there's, there's, there's questions about that. You know, can, can, yeah. will we get to a point where we trust them implicitly to shut things down, or will humans always need to be in the mix to make that decision? It, it's the driverless car problem, right? At what point, you know, you have to, when things go wrong, and they will, right? Who do you blame? Who has liability? I hate to say it, it's as much a, a legal problem as anything else, right? Because now in the enterprise, in the large enterprises, these are you know extremely meaningful and these decisions have impact financially, operational, reputationally. So yeah. you can't just heave it over the wall and say the machine told me to do it. So I I think AI and ML and automation gives you it has the opportunity to give you better data to work with, but at the end of the day, the CISO, the CIO, somebody or a team needs to make a decision based upon best available information. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's I think it's going to provide much better data, uh, more actionable data. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, ML and AI are built by people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I've, I've been reading where some can be used for good and some can be used for yeah. evil. Um, and it, that, that information or those, those types of technology, you mm -hmm. know, can sway how people think about things. So we need to really be careful um, from an information security space if those bad guys get in to the AI or the ML, you know, what what does that, what information is going to be provided? Uh, and so I do believe you still need that human intervention because you know that you can, you can assume or they can, that the technology can assume what the actions of a person is, but they don't know the heart of the person. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know that, you know, something, you know, they were given an, uh, a job to do and something went on or, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I'll, I'll give a, a great example of uh, a customer, uh, the, the uh, manager was on vacation, had just deployed this technology that, <clears throat> uh, you know, and went in and said, okay, it had supposedly learned and then deployed the next piece of technology that would shut things down because of behavior, right? Yeah. Uh, something happened, uh, and the the IT manager was on vacation um, in a remote location, uh, which he has never been before. And they were shut down, uh, and this technology did that, and he couldn't get in because that was not his normal pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. And so it was a hot mess. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that... Uh, you know, and that's a true life example of, mm -hmm. of what can happen and where organizations need to have that human element uh, always. Yeah, I, I think that the, the case law is going to be interesting here. It'll probably be decided in other areas. I, I suspect in healthcare, uh, some 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 algorithm misclassified a, a cancer x-ray for yeah. example or a robo advisor at a big brokerage firm lost a lot of money for somebody so you know who's at fault i think that we most likely see case law in other industries before uh, because i think security we are we're a little extra cautious so it has mm -hmm. to <laughs> what this is dirt <laughs> just a little, just a little bit. Um, looking forward, a lot of times I get questions about um, basically companies want minority report. They want their threat detection to not just detect, but also to predict if something is going to happen in the future. What would that look like, and how reasonable is that as a possibility in, in, in the future? To tell the future about the future. I mean, there's a lot in. There have been a lot of developments and advancements, and especially in behavioral analytics, where you know you're using previous um, behaviors that have been observed or threats that have been observed and outcomes. You know, scanning is a great example of it, right? You, you're or, or detecting unwanted scans, I should say. You know, you know it's a precursor to precursor. other kinds of behavior, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of tried and true. Um, capabilities in that area. Again, this is where 
you know, I think the combination of human intelligence plus some of these new tools can better help people extract patterns from what is, you know, you talked before about the, you know, overwhelming amount of data people are getting. Well, again, here's a good use of technology to extract patterns and take a look for what could uh, some, some th threat vectors that could have been hidden in the noise to anticipate that. So I think that's, again, where tools plus human intelligence can can help get a, try to get ahead of some of these things. Well, I kind of tweak that a little bit because behavior analytics has been around for a long, long time. Understood, yeah. Um, so say, same with pattern. Um, I mean, endpoint, you look at that. I mean, that's what they've mm -hmm. been doing, and it's still a necessary, um, not not necessary, necessary, um, you know, because it gets rid of the noise um, so that organizations can look at the really bad stuff, right? Um, and so I, I think that that's been there. I think that there's new ways, and not necessarily just with um ML and AI, but just new ways of looking at um, the threat vectors, the vulnerability, mm -hmm. bad actors themselves, and, and learning more about what they're doing and how they're mm -hmm. connecting uh, mm -hmm. to kind of put together those teams, those threat teams, yeah. um, whether it's internal, whether it's external. Um, and and I, I look at our customers on being much more sophisticated on how they're building out their vulnerability management programs. Um, it's not just doing a penetration test now. Yeah. It's doing a penetration to external penetration test. It's doing internal penetration test. It's doing firewall rule reviews. It's doing a wireless um, you know, configuration review. It's doing a wireless penetration test. Mm -hmm. It's doing social. It's doing phishing. It's doing um, physical. It's doing all of this stuff and not just that one component where an organization did before and then putting those ongoing components in. So again, like what I said before, it's a program and it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's as it's not even sophistication. I think it's maturity. And, you know, yeah. we're putting a lot of maturity capability models for our organ or our customers now, too, where, you know, they started here and they're here, but they want to get to here. And what does that look like? And is it with NIST or with ISO or what, whatever control framework that they want to work on? But again, you know, taking that to the board so that they can show um, what they've accomplished and how they've kept the bad guys out, or if they haven't kept the bad guys out, all the crap that they've done <laughs> to try to keep them out. You know, and yeah. unfortunately, it's just going to happen. Yeah. I don't think that answered your question. But <laughs> well, but it was a really interesting place to go. And it actually it made me lead to another question, which is you know, you're talking about doing penetration tests. And I'm wondering what you see in terms of, do you think companies are doing a good job of closing the learning loop? So there's a pen test where you've got a red team. Um, is that then, is that information being uh, sent to the ops team so they could maybe set different configurations, but also to the, uh, the hunter and responder team and the, and the analysts and the SOC, are they now adding new rules based on those learnings? Or do you, do you see that as, as it's, it's, you get an audit or a pen test, here's a bunch of stuff, and, and it kind of just doesn't get reused or used in an optimized way? I, I, um, I wish I could say yes. Uh, yeah. You know, our, we have our, our customer size or the mid size, so it's not like the gigantic, uh, you know, hundred thousand dollar or hundred thousand um, person company or forty thousand person company. It's the company that's around five thousand to about two hundred and fifty, um, and so you know, a lot of times they don't have quote unquote the red teams or the threat hunters. So it, it kind of changes the dyna dynamic. So the utilization of automated technology, I think, becomes probably more imperative. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we still see when we're doing the technology or the, the technical, you know, technical or vulnerability assessments that, you know, certain pieces get remediated and then the rest kind of just gets 
put aside and that makes my heart hurt you know when we're brought in the next the next year and nothing's been done and it's like mm -hmm. why are we doing this again if you haven't fixed what we found last time and we make it actionable it's not like we give an organization a hundred things to do we say here are 10 or 15 things that you need to do to protect your organization so i, I wish i could say yes um because we try to feed it to our customers as best as we can to make it easy to ingest and and and, and share um but i think some of it goes back to what you were saying Diane, um a little bit ago about the the people not necessarily having the training to be able to do it too mm -hmm. and i think that yeah. there's a there's a disconnect on that so there's different technologies yeah. that are going to be coming out which are really cool um on actually testing your employees or your admins mm -hmm. or your you know security admins to exactly what their strengths and weaknesses are and i think that's a whole different ball game because then yeah. you know you can you can really understand i didn't mean to yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I agree. You know, and it is. It's, it's like it'd be nice if there was a better loop getting closed. You know, right. I love to say everybody does it, but it, it's I, if people could kind of get one, a couple of things out of this. One of the things I, I, I hope that they they can hear is that automation actually needs to be set up and supported and managed properly, yes. so that it's not. There's no magic. You, you turn something on. There's the magic ML, and it, mm -hmm. it's going to be able to figure everything out for you and start fixing your network automatically that it's really it's a combination and when you feed the right information to the tools you tune them properly you can get some really fast amazing automated um you know insights but it's there's it's not a just turn it on and and learning and and what you know some of the problems are can really help yeah. with the strength overall um so, uh, Peter, do you think that organizations are serious enough right now about how they're looking at uh, the the multifaceted bits of data they need to bring into their detection system? So, looking at things like cloud security and actually going forward with more automated threat detection and, and less of an annual approach. Well, yeah, they're definitely more serious now. They're asking the questions, right? And it's you know, it's back to what Michelle was saying. Do they have? The willingness to act at the end of the day uh, that varies right from customer to customer and it takes that to really close the loop but people are asking the questions they're more interested you know when we started this company when i came to this company three years ago people were looking at us funny like you, know, you can detect what and where and who wants to see that stuff and now people are going oh yeah i get it it's you know we're in a perimeter you know, borderless world, perimeterless world, shoot, we need to be able to get, you know, more situational awareness, not just endpoint, not just, uh, uh, you know, other detection and prevention tools. So there, there is a general awareness. Um, uh, you know, again, I'd like to say people were more, uh, were quicker to adopt, but, uh, you know, people are willing to have the conversation. They're willing, in our case, to come back in with third-party providers, analytics providers, et cetera, who can help kind of stitch all these disparate data sources together to get a more holistic view. But, um, you know, in some cases, it's a challenge, right? Because we're kind of betwixt and between, you know, people have their old purpose-built systems, whether they're, you know, IDS systems, et cetera, and now we're saying, wow, you need to you need to have a collection of data sources, and you need to have a collection. You need to have analytics tools to really get a better look at this. And they get it, but they're really looking to you know the vendor community, the supplier community, to show them the way. I think so. They're they're willing. They want to hear the answer, but you know we're still early stages in some of these cases. And then we got the constantly evolving technologies kind of working against us, as I said, for, you know, borderless security and all that, where they're like, oh, shoot, I understood where to put my firewall, my network before, but what the heck does this mean now, right? So, but it's getting there. All is not lost. Technology will ultimately help us get ahead of this. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> right. That's right. We all have to believe or yeah, we have to get up in the morning. Uh, so um, there's a, a question that came in from the audience about you know just some really pragmatic approach. Let's say you haven't done any automated threat detection yet. What would what would your advice be 
uh, Michelle, on where, where would organizations start? What are some of the things that they need to be thinking about before they, they implement a program for automated threat detection? So I, I think where we would start with a customer is really about what Peter talked about at the very beginning is threat to or risk tolerance, right? And you know what what is that level of risk tolerance? And you know what is the size of the organization? What type of organization? What um, regulations uh, need to uh, be adhered to? Uh, what state do they live in? You know, Massachusetts has a certain regulation. California now has the GDPR regulation you know are they uh you know in new york and they're a financial organization i mean there's a whole bunch of different questions that need to be answered and then you know what type of data do they have you know how how uh, many sites do they have there's a lot of different questions that need to be answered and mm -hmm. you know what kind of vulnerability management program do they have right now what are the people that they have what are the policies and processes that they have uh and then you know build it out from there so it's customized for that specific organization because information security you know there's companies like mine that say oh yeah we can do that and you know you need to do this this and this and information security yeah. that i've learned is not one size fits all and if an organization's saying that they, they can't do yeah. it you know, there's yeah. a lot of questions that need to be answered to do it right yeah very good point. Could yeah. be snake oil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Well, automation for some people could just be a checklist. We've seen this in healthcare, right? I mean, well, so can a penetration test. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it could be as easy as that for someone. But back to your point, Michelle, it's a matter of baselining where you are and, and then having a roadmap for where you want to go. Right. How about playbooks? So you've got the automated detection, and, and you're, again, the, 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 the tree fell in the woods. How important are playbooks to the, the program and the rollout? So when we, and I'll, I'll take that real quick, and, and Peter, I'll turn it over to you because I think it's really important. So when we build out, and I know this is not the topic, but just a great example is an incident response plan, right? So you have an incident response plan, and we build that. Then we build out playbooks. Um, in that incident response plan. So denial of service attack, a ransomware attack, a breach, you know, um, or whatever it is. And so you have those specific playbooks that you can pull out. The same thing goes, um, you know, for vulnerability management or anything that you do. If there's something, again, it's that repeatable process. It's documentation. And I know it's a pain in the ass, excuse my language, but I can tell you, I mean, when you have that playbook and something's going on and you can pull it out and say, okay, here are the five steps that I need to follow, you know, and now our customers are asking for, which I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I totally agree. I mean, you know, whether it's it's the, the vulnerability, the, the threat is there's an unpatched system, there's a system that's now gone, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's supposed to, it moved, it was through V-Motion, it moved to a, a less secure enclave, or if it's an actual attack, how do you respond is, you yeah. know, that, that's critical. And a lot of times if it's not written down or at least practiced. Yeah. Yeah, I think some of our, our 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 vendors, our partners, are actually creating playbooks More so, on yeah. the utilization yeah. of the technology, which I think is really cool inside yeah. that specific organization. And I think that that's that's huge. Again, repeatable process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's again, that's kind of the baseline of automation, right? You can take a playbook and a workflow, and now you can automate it to the nth degree. Yeah. But you, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. All right. So, so looking to the future, we've got time for one more question. Um, looking to the future, uh, what do you see as changing in the threat in the landscape of automated threat detection? And what would you advise people to be looking at or thinking about now so they can be ready for the next two, three, five years? So, I mean, we, we talked about Quite changed quite a bit earlier on. I, you know, one aspect is the sophistication of the bad bad folks. The fact that there's more collaboration. Um, you, you got the changes as we talked about the shift to perimeterless organizations, more you know, mobile IoT, etc. Um, so that's all causing you know organizations to look differently at security and really rethink their posture towards automation. And uh, in many cases, rethinking 
who they need to be partnering with, you know, has their ability to keep up with the threat landscape evolved, you know, uh, have, have the bad guys evolved beyond the point to where they can defend themselves and look to more, you know, cloud-based and services-based solutions. So I think it, it really causes people to, to do that more. Um, and that, that in my mind, that seems to be, you know, the biggest threat there is the speed and scale of the bad actors, yes. uh, speed, scale, and sophistication of bad actors. So. Well, for the need for speed and sophistication. Yes. So yeah. any, any, any closing remarks about what I would, works? I would add on that really, really quick um, is uh, awareness and training uh, for, for the, um, the IT and security staff. Uh, as well as your employees. I think that that's, you know, the, the bad guys are getting badder by the day um, and more sophisticated. And we're, we're actually creating much more, com com we're creating more complex applications um, in, with different platforms and things like that. So it makes it easier for them to break in. Um, yeah. but, uh, but just just being aware uh, I think, and, and getting that training so that people actually know how to do the patching, how to do the, the yeah. vulnerability management, because I think that there's there's a lot of um, yeah people that don't right now, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. Good yeah. point. Yeah. Great advice, and I, I, I completely agree. And, you know, also just the, the looking at machine learning tools, not that there's magic, right? This is math. Mm -hmm probability right. but yeah. looking at these tools to help us with being able to to deal with just the um, the number of different the, the 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 vast amount of signal that we're collecting and the the many many paths of the mm -hmm. that can go through our systems you know we're it, we're really gone into this very next next level kind of space in terms of mm -hmm. where attackers can infiltrate us in so many different clouds and so many different um, you know even you know through our phones through our cars mm -hmm. so yeah I think looking at at, at automated systems that understand machine learning and, and responsible AI are going to be a really big, uh, going to be a requirement, I think, to keep up with the noise in the future. All right. Thank you both so much. This has been a great conversation. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, really Thank you. Talking with you. I hope that the audience uh, learned some, some good, uh, good insights. And thank you again for your questions and for listening in. All right. Thanks a lot.